Welcome to Technomic China Insider. Here we cover the latest in China's tech, business, and innovation. Subscribe for fresh insights and analysis on how China is shaping the future of the global economy. Part 1. Doing research, doing exploration, do the most important, most difficult thing. Recently, Phantom Fund announced its decision to enter the large model space. Why is a quantitative fund? doing something like this. Our focus on large models actually has no direct connection to quantitative finance or financial services. We've independently set up a new company called DeepSeek to pursue this. Many people in Phantom Fund's core team come from the AI field. We experimented with many scenarios and ultimately decided to tackle sufficiently complex financial problems. We believe that general artificial intelligence, AGI, could be one of the next big challenges. So for us, it's more about how to do it rather than why we're doing it. Are you training a general large model? or focusing on a specific vertical, like a finance large model? Our goal is to build general artificial intelligence, AGI, a large language model is likely the necessary path towards AGI, and it already has some characteristics of AGI. So we'll start here, and eventually we'll explore areas like vision as well. With the big tech companies entering the field, many startups have given up on focusing solely on general large models. We won't prematurely design applications based on models, we're focusing solely on the large model itself. Many people believe that after the big companies have formed a consensus, it's not a good time for startups to enter the field. Looking at it now, whether it's big tech companies or startups, it's hard to quickly build a technological advantage to crush competitors. With OpenAI leading the way and everything being based on publicly available papers and code, it's likely that by next year, both big companies and startups will have their own large language models. Both big companies and startups have opportunities. The existing vertical scenarios are not controlled by startups, so this phase isn't particularly friendly for them. But because these scenarios are, in essence, fragmented and involve smaller, dispersed demands, they are more suitable for flexible startup organizations. In the long run, the barriers to entry for large model applications will continue to lower and any startup entering the field over the next 20 years will have a chance. Our goal is clear. We are not focusing on verticals or applications, but on research and exploration. Why do you define your goal as doing research and exploration? It's driven by curiosity. From a broad perspective, we want to validate certain hypotheses. For instance, we believe that the essence of human intelligence could be language, and human thinking could be a language process. You might think you are thinking, but in fact, you might just be weaving language in your mind. This means that large language models could potentially give rise to human-like artificial intelligence, AGI. From a closer perspective, GPT-4 still holds many unsolved mysteries. While we replicate it, we are also conducting research to uncover these mysteries. But research involves much higher costs. If we were just replicating, we could... Base it on publicly available papers or open source code, training just a few times, or even fine tuning, which would keep costs low. But conducting research requires a variety of experiments and comparisons, which demands more computational power and more highly skilled personnel, making it much more expensive. So, where does the funding for this research come from? Phantom Fund, as one of our investors, provides ample RD budgets. Additionally, there's an annual donation budget of several hundred million yuan, which was previously allocated to charitable organizations but can be adjusted if needed. But to develop foundational large models, you need at least two to three hundred million dollars. How do you sustain continuous investment? We are also talking to different investors. From our discussions, we found that many VCs are hesitant about funding research because they have exit demands and want products to be commercialized quickly. According to our priority of research, it's difficult to secure funding from VCs. However, we have the computational power and an engineering team, which gives us half of the necessary capital. What assumptions or models have we made about the business model? What we're thinking now is that in the future, we will make most of our training results publicly available. This way, we can integrate it with commercialization. We want more people, even with a small app, 
to be able to use large models at low cost rather than have this technology monopolized by a few people or companies. Some big companies will offer similar services later on. What's your differentiating factor? Big companies' models will likely be tied to their platforms or ecosystems, whereas ours will be completely free and independent. Regardless, um, it seems somewhat crazy for a commercial company to invest in... Uh, Endless research and exploration. If you are looking for a business reason, it may be hard to find one because it's not financially attractive. From a business perspective, basic research has a very low return on investment. When OpenAI's early investors put in money, they weren't thinking about how much return they'd get. They were genuinely interested in pursuing the project. What we're certain about now is that since we want to do this and have the capability, this is the right time. And we are one of the most suitable candidates. Part two, the reserve of one zero 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 cards and its cost. An exciting thing might not be something that can simply be measured in terms of money. GPU is the scarce resource in this chat GPT driven startup wave. You had the foresight to reserve one zero 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 GPUs back in 2021.Y. Actually, it's been a gradual process from having just one GPU in the early days to 100 in 2015, 1000 in 2019, and then one zero 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 GPUs. The scale kept growing. Before we reached a few hundred GPUs, we outsourced to an IDC. As the scale grew, outsourcing could no longer meet our requirements. So we started building our own data centers. Many people might think there's some hidden business logic behind this, but actually it was primarily driven by curiosity. What kind of curiosity? Curiosity about the boundaries of AI capabilities. For many outsiders, the chat GPT wave was a huge shock. But for insiders, the impact of AlexNet in 2012 already marked the beginning of a new era. AlexNet's error rate was much lower than other models at the time and it revived neural network research that had been dormant for decades. Although specific technical directions have been changing, the combination of models, data, and computing power remains constant. Especially after OpenAI released GPT-3 in 2020, the direction became clear. Massive computing power was needed. But even in 2021, when we invested in building Firefly 2, most people still couldn't understand it. Yeah, so you started focusing on computing power reserves since 2012. Yes, for researchers, the demand for computing power is endless. After conducting small-scale experiments, you always want to do larger-scale ones. Since then, we've been consciously deploying as much computing power as possible. Many people assume that you built this computer cluster to use machine learning for price prediction in quantitative trading? If we were purely focused on quantitative investing, a small number of GPUs would suffice. But beyond investing, we've done a lot of research to figure out what paradigms can fully describe the entire financial market, whether there's a simpler way to express it, where the boundaries of these different paradigms lie, and whether these paradigms are more widely applicable, etc. But this process is also a money-burning activity. You know, something exciting can't always be measured just by money. It's like buying a piano for the house. One, you can afford it. And two, there's a group of people eager to play it. Graphics cards typically depreciate at a rate of 20%. We haven't calculated the depreciation exactly, but it shouldn't be that much. NVIDIA's GPUs are a form of hard currency. Even older cards, many years old, are still in use. The old GPUs we retired were still quite valuable when we sold them secondhand, so we didn't lose much. If building a computer cluster with maintenance costs, labor costs, and even electricity expenses is not a small expense. The electricity and maintenance costs are actually very low, making up only about 1% of the hardware cost per year. Labor costs are higher but they are an investment in the future. The team is our greatest asset. We select people who are relatively humble and curious, 
giving them the opportunity to do research here uh, that can lead to marketable ideas in the future. In 2021, Phantom Fund was one of the first companies in the Asia Pacific region to receive a hundred GPUs. Why did you get them earlier than some cloud service providers? We started early with research, testing, and planning for the new cards. As for the cloud service providers, from what I know, their needs were scattered at first. It wasn't until 2022 when there was a demand for machine rental for autonomous driving training that some cloud providers began building the necessary infrastructure. Big tech companies find it hard to just focus on research and training. Their operations are more driven by business needs. How do you see the competitive landscape of large models? Big companies certainly have an advantage, but if they can't apply it quickly, they might not be able to keep pushing forward because they need to see results fast. Leading startups also have solid technology, but just like the earlier wave of AI startups, they have to face the commercialization challenges. Some people may think that a quantitative fund emphasizing AI is just trying to hype up other business areas. Actually, our quantitative fund has mostly stopped raising external funds. How would you differentiate AI believers from opportunists? Believers were already here before, and they will still be here later. They're more likely to buy GPUs in bulk or sign long-term contracts with cloud providers rather than renting them short-term. Um, so basically the, the... Part three, how to make innovation truly happen. Innovation often happens on its own, not by deliberate arrangement, and certainly not something that can be taught. How is the recruitment progress for the deep exploration team? The, the initial team has been assembled in the early stages due to a lack of personnel. We temporarily borrowed some people from a Phantom Fund. We started recruitment late last year when ChatGPT 3.5 became popular but we still need more people to join. Talent for large model startups is also scarce. Some investors say that many suitable talents might only be found in AI labs of giants like OpenAI or Facebook AI research. Will you recruit such talent from abroad? If we are pursuing short-term goals, then finding experienced people is the right approach. But looking at the long-term, Experience is not that important. Basic abilities, creativity, and passion are more important. From this perspective, there are plenty of suitable candidates within China. Why isn't experience that important? It's not necessarily the case that only those who have done something before can do it. At Phantom Fund, one of our recruitment principles is to focus on ability, not experience. For our core technical roles, most people are fresh graduates or have only one or two years of experience. Do you think experience is a hindrance in innovative business? When doing something, experienced people will quickly tell you what should be done. But those without experience will experiment repeatedly, think carefully about what to do, and then find a solution that fits the current situation. Phantom Fund entered the financial industry despite having no background in it and within a few years became one of the leading firms. Is this recruitment approach one of the secrets to your success? Our core team, including myself, didn't have any experience in quantitative finance at the beginning. This is quite unique. It's not necessarily the secret to our success, but it is one of Phantom Fund's cultural traits. We don't deliberately avoid experienced people, but we focus more on ability. Take the sales role as an example. Our two main salespeople were newcomers to the industry. One used to work in German machinery foreign trade, and the other was previously writing code in a brokerage's back office. When they entered the industry, they had no experience, no resources, and no accumulation. Now, we might be the only large private equity firm that mainly focuses on direct sales, Doing direct sales means we don't need to pay intermediaries, which leads to higher profit margins with the same scale and performance. Many firms have tried to imitate us, but they haven't succeeded. Why have many firms tried to imitate you but failed? Uh, because 
This alone is not enough to spark innovation. It needs to align with the company's culture and management. In fact, in the first year, they didn't achieve anything, and it wasn't until the second year that they started to make progress. But our evaluation standards are different from most companies. We don't have KPIs, and we don't set tasks. So what are your evaluation standards? Unlike most companies, we don't focus on customer orders. The amount of sales doesn't determine commissions right from the start. Instead, we encourage our salespeople to expand their own networks, meet more people, and have a greater influence. We believe that a trustworthy, upright salesperson might not immediately get customers to place orders, but they can make you feel they're reliable. Once you've selected the right person, how do you help them get into the groove? We give them important tasks and don't intervene. We let them figure things out and express themselves. In fact, the DNA of a company is very hard to replicate. For example, how to assess the potential of someone with no experience and how to help them grow once they're hired can't be directly copied. What do you think are the necessary conditions for building an innovative organization? Our conclusion is that Innovation needs as little intervention and management as possible, allowing everyone the freedom to express themselves and the opportunity to make mistakes. Innovation often happens on its own, not deliberately arranged, and certainly not taught. This is quite an unconventional management approach. How do you ensure that someone is efficient and heading in the direction you want in this case? We ensure alignment in values when hiring, and then maintain consistency through company culture. Of course, we don't have a written corporate culture because anything written would hinder innovation. More often than not, it's the leaders leading by example. How you make decisions when facing something becomes a guideline. Do you think that for the large model competition, the innovative organizational structure of startups will be the breakthrough point to compete with big companies. According to textbook methodology, startup companies today wouldn't survive. But the market is changing. The true driving force is often not the existing rules and conditions, but the ability to adapt and adjust to change. Many large companies' organizational structures can't respond or act quickly, and they often let past experiences and inertia become shackles. In this new AI wave, a batch of new companies will definitely emerge. Part four, true madness. Innovation is expensive and inefficient, sometimes accompanied by waste. What excites you the most about doing this? It's figuring out whether our assumptions are correct. If they are, it's really exciting. When recruiting for the large models, what are the must-have conditions for candidates? Passion and solid foundational skills. Everything else isn't that important. Is it easy to find such people? Their passion usually shows because they genuinely want to do this. So these people are often also looking for you. Large models might be an endless investment. Does the cost make you hesitate? Innovation is expensive and inefficient. Sometimes it comes with waste. That's why innovation can only emerge when the economy has developed to a certain point. When you're poor or in a non-innovation-driven industry, cost and efficiency are critical. Look at OpenAI. They burned a lot of money to get where they are. Do you think you're doing something crazy? I don't know if it's crazy, but there are many things in the world that can't be explained by logic. Just like many programmers who are crazy contributors to open source communities, they're exhausted after a whole day yet still go on to contribute code. There's a kind of spiritual reward in this. It's like hiking 50 kilometers. You're physically exhausted, but your spirit is satisfied. Do you think this curiosity-driven madness can continue forever? Not everyone can be crazy for a lifetime, but most people during their younger years can totally immerse themselves in something without any selfish motives 